How's everyone doing today? This is Chopping It Up Hardcore with Hal Capone, discussion number 69. Today, my special guest is Iggy, the vocalist from the brutal vegan straight edge 90s hardcore band Abnegation. He was also in a band called Break Iron before that. Uh, we'll get into all that kind of stuff. Um, can't wait. He's a hip hop enthusiast. So um, here we go. I'll try to get you going right here. Hold on. Bite right now. Iggy. Yo, what's up, man? What's going on? Not too much. How you doing over on the East Coast? Uh, not too bad. Um, I want to thank you so much for taking time out to do this, especially on a Sunday. I know people are busy and, and you know, doing kinds of crazy. Dude, Sunday's for chilling, man. It's good. <laughs> this is the perfect day to do it, for sure. Well, thanks again. I, I definitely appreciate it. Um, yeah, thanks for having me, man. Usually when I start off these talks, I usually ask um, – what was the first thing that you, uh, you know, kind of gravitated towards musically before hardcore? Like, what were you listening to when you were a kid? Uh, you know, man, my, my first real, like, uh, passion was um, hip-hop, man. I got into, like, uh, Houdini. I was into breakdancing and stuff. That was probably, like, around fourth, fifth grade. Um, and... Uh, that, you know, I had little things before that. I, uh, like, I really dug Rick Springfield. Yeah. That was pretty cool, <laughs> you know. But I think uh, as far as uh, what what really got me, it was hip-hop. Nice, nice. Is there a way I can put this sideways? I'm going to try. Is that messing other people up, though? You're sideways to me now. Yeah. Eh, I'll just stick it like this. Let's see if I can... I've got strategy, man. <laughs> there we go. Nice. Uh, what other hip hop uh, did you like back then? I mean, I was I was a big. I'm still a big hip hop guy back. And I started same here. That started out with like Run DMC and Fat Boys and the first LL Cool J radio. Uh, yep. You know, Bigger and Deffer was huge for me. Uh, what else were you listening to for hip hop back then? That kind of you, you know some of your favorites. So Houdini. Um, I got way into, uh, like, basically, I had the Beat Street soundtrack. Mm. So that was on all the time. Uh, the Run DMC, the first one, um, I think that was Raising Hell. Yeah. Uh, and, oh, and the one with, uh, like, Rockbox oh, yeah. on it. Um, Grandmaster Flash. Uh, I'm trying to think. Oh, Nucleus. I love Jam on it, man. That was my jam for sure. Um trying to think you know it wasn't until be, coming from erie uh you know it is uh it's a smaller town so it took me a while to really find like stuff that like i, I could really identify with and that like around like uh oh and eric being rock him too but um like tribe called quest when the native tongue stuff started to drop and all that that's when i i really felt uh, uh more of a connection with hip-hop because it really taught me I could be myself. Yeah, yeah. Now, now, were you skateboarding at the time, too? When, when you uh, I didn't start skating t until, like, 7th uh, or 8th grade. Um, that was when I finally convinced my mom to let me let me have a board. It took took a while. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, see, yeah, that was 7th and 8th grade. And, uh, you know, and that was right at the, the start of when I was starting to get into punk rock, too, and hardcore and stuff. Yeah. And and what was some of the first things that you heard for hardcore and punk rock and stuff like that that kind of changed, switched gears for you a little bit from, like, obviously you still liked hip-hop, but what made it kind of switch gears to, like, punk and hardcore for you? Like, what were some of the bands that kind of grabbed you? Yeah. Uh, so my brother, um, I have an older brother. He made me a... Uh, mixtape back in the day that uh, it had um, UK subs, Sham 69, Stiff Little Fingers, and like Dead Milkman, or, and the Dead Kennedys. Uh, it was like a Christmas present. But um, so that really, like, I just played the hell out of that. And then um, what, how that proceeded was uh, there was a radio show here called Angry Red Radio that uh, this dude Dan Allen did on, on one of the local college stations. So then I just started, I mean, it was like two hours of the best stuff ever. Yeah. And uh, 
So I was starting to get more into, I was realizing there was harder stuff than like the, you know, the punk stuff that I was listening to. Yeah. Like Swizz was one of the first bands I really started to get into and Laughing Hyenas. Uh, trying to think of, you know, he, he would just play everything. I don't know why my mind's drawing a blank right now, but um, yeah, Adolescence. Uh, knife dance. They used to come through Erie all the time. They're like a, a Cleveland band. Yeah. Now, did did they play like the New York stuff back then? Like uh, you know, grilled. Skit- uh, you know what, man? Actually, no. Uh, he didn't really play a lot of the New York stuff. It was uh, once. So the other thing that was great about that show was um, that's how I found out about all Asia shows starting to happen, uh, and like. Um, so once I started going to those a couple times, I ended up meeting up with like uh, Mike Ski from Brothers Keeper, uh, my buddy Rob, the dude Rob Whipple. These guys were sort of like the, I don't know, like you just knew that they knew they were about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so they sort of took me under their wing um, and I got open to a lot more. And that that's who really introduced me to a lot of the New York hardcore stuff. Like, I had just missed the Revelation tour come through, like, Buffalo and Cleveland, and they had just gone. Yeah. Uh, and I wasn't allowed to go to out-of-town shows yet either, so. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, they, they had all the new, like, they had the Judge 7-inch. They had Start Today. And so that stuff, I was like, oh, my God, all right. And then not only that, but um, I, uh, you know, I, I had never done any drugs up until that point or drank. And, uh you know, they, they were straight edge and they, they really introduced me to what like straight edge is about. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yes, Rob, you like straight edge stuff too, dude. <laughs> but, uh, Oh, I see what he was saying. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm easily distracted today, dude. Maybe Sundays aren't a good day. <laughs> uh, but, um, so yeah. Anyways, that's how I got introduced to Straight Edge, and and, and you know, as like a movement and a, a philosophy and a, a way of life. Yeah. And what age were you at that time when that was kind? Of- that was like uh, thirteen, thirteen or fourteen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, now, did you always have aspirations to get into a band once you started listening to this kind of music, uh, or did you have friends that were already kind of in the scene that were playing music? Around- you know, uh I, like when I brought up Briggs Springfield, man, even then I wanted to be in a band, right? And then um, starting to go to shows and Mike, uh, Mike Ski and a couple of other dudes um, were starting their own bands and stuff. And I knew I wanted to be more involved than just someone that went to shows. Yeah. And I knew I did not know how to play any instruments. So I figured I'd be a singer. <laughs> um, and then, uh, so, you know, you just end up, especially at shows where like I was lucky in that when I got into going to shows, it was something that was just starting to happen too in Erie yeah. uh, as far as all ages shows and stuff go. Yeah. So it was so new and there's so many kids meeting each other for the first time that it was real easy to link up with kids and be like, all right, let's just do this. And it's punk. So you didn't even have to sound good. Yeah. So <laughs> um, what, what was the first band that you got into that you actually played shows? Uh, it was a break iron or was there a band beforehand? Me and uh, my buddy, Brian and this girl, Emily, we had a show or a band called thorn thorn in your side or thorn in my side. But uh, we only play like, one house show yeah but other than that um the the first band that really uh played shows was break iron Very yeah that's nice um yeah and how how was that like playing shows for the first time for you being a vocalist it, was there any like nerves in it because i was a vocalist in a few small bands in new hampshire and stuff like that and at first my nerves were you know kind of you know frazzled a little bit yeah you know, a lot of people turn their back towards the crowd when they first start out and stuff like that. <laughs> How about for you when you first started playing out? You know, man, my big, I mean, I, I definitely, uh, definitely it took a lot for me to really get comfortable being up on a stage. Um, I think my, my biggest issues was remembering my lyrics. That was always a tough thing. And then also, um, you know, 
we we had an opportunity to play with a lot of great bands uh and some of my favorite bands still like uh integrity and um zero tolerance from buffalo yep. and playing with those guys i definitely you know would have butterflies and i wanted to make sure i did everything right and all that stuff so that those moments were, were definitely some that made me just really have to like get my head in gear in order to play yeah now was that with break iron or was that with abnegation that you played with those bands uh that was with break iron break iron nice, nice. yeah yeah like uh being from erie it's right in the middle of buffalo cleveland and pittsburgh mm -hmm. so it was definitely a, a spot for bands to hit while when they were going to those other cities so we were able to get like we were seeing integrity a lot right when they dropped uh those who fear tomorrow. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it, it was, uh, yeah, we, we just lucked out and being able to, to play with those bands early on. Yeah. That's, that's sick. I, like, um, yeah. I always loved that, that, uh, record. And then once systems overload came out, I was like, Jesus, that like, and pretty just blew me away. Once that came out, I was like, wow. Band is like I, I'm a those who fear tomorrow guy, man. Are you really nice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I do like systems, yeah. but I, I definitely, I, I definitely like those those who fear tomorrow, and then like the single, like the stuff that was coming out, like the comp tracks that they did. Those, I mean, I think that's the best integrity stuff. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm a systems guy, so that's a yeah. No, uh, it's good, man. It's good. Um, when you mentioned zero tolerance, I always like when I heard zero tolerance. I always thought the music almost sounded like leeway to me. Not the vocals like so much, but it had like that metallic like, oh yeah, hardcorey like leeway sounding like riffs and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I mean they were definitely um, going for you know they they morphed into this ultra powerful band that I mean live were just amazing. And I, I feel like they they knew the direction they wanted to go. So they like really hone in on that like way big metal sound. Like their recordings are all awesome. Uh to me, man, I I, I don't even really like Metallica, but I like zero tolerance and they sort of sound like Metallica. <laughs> Oh, so you were never kind of into the thrash movement beforehand? Ah, uh, you know what, man? Not really, dude. Like, um, uh, Mike Ski, he loved DRI, mm. uh, dealing with it era stuff. And so I would listen to that. And, like, I love suicidal tendencies. Um, but for the most part, nah, I didn't really get into a lot of the thrash metal stuff. Yeah, yeah. Suicidal, the first album, is, is like, way different than, like, Join the Army. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah gears a little bit and tried to yes not not radio friendly but kind of mellower you know where <laughs> yeah fast and like short songs like that that first album was but yeah that's for sure um so how did break iron get together i know paul and you kind of uh you know got together and yeah. and uh t tell me a little bit about that about break iron yes uh so um that was Right when like integrity started to, to come through Erie a bunch, yeah. And uh, Paul and our drummer Chris, who would uh, also later on be in Abnegation, mm -hmm. they were like total metal dudes. But they found out about shows and integrity especially, so they started coming around a lot more. And I ended up, um, I was going to high school with them both, uh, so we were like, well, you know, let's let's give this a shot. And, I, and then we uh, got this kid Zach. And Josh, who were just like, you know, like punk rock dudes, hardcore. And I wasn't really, they weren't really into like straight edge or anything like that. Yeah. But they wanted to play some heavy music. So we we just started taking over my mom's garage and just, you know, just went at it, man. Now, was Break Iron like a straight edge band at that time? No. No. Just no, I was straight edge. And uh, Paul and Chris got into straight edge, not necessarily when the band started. But, um, you know, later on, yeah. uh, Josh and Zach, though, were not straight edge at all. <laughs> that was not their deal. <laughs> and, and what kind of influenced you to go straight edge? Was it, I mean, I know for me, uh, you know, Earth Crisis was huge for me. When they first came out with All Out War and the Firestorm 7-inch. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was like a big impact for me back then. Um, I don't know if it was for you, but um, what kind of, like, led you to 
becoming straight edge? So, um, you know, I already knew I'd been offered uh, weed and, you know, beers here and there. And it just it wasn't anything that appealed to me. Mm-hmm. And then um, I ended up uh, stealing the uh, can't close my eyes and minor threat out of step out of this chain store from the mall. Not record den. Just so Ben, if he is watching, it wasn't wasn't record den, dude. Uh, this place now is rec- record mark. And it was just like the cases appealed to me. I was like, yeah. oh, this dude has shaved head. Yeah. This is crazy. So, you know, hearing that and reading those lyrics and just taking that to heart, I was like, oh, all right. This this is my thing. This is my people, you know? Yeah. Nice. But, I mean, Earth Crisis definitely was a huge influence, uh, but more so with, with abnegation, you know, that – they were definitely a huge influence on me and Paul being like, all right, let's start a straight edge band. Cause Erie, Erie didn't have like a straight up straight edge band yeah. at all. So we were, you know, that they were definitely hearing what they were saying and feeling like it was an important thing to have an Erie to really, you know, get that message out um, was, was definitely a, a prime motivator for us. Yeah. Because I mean, earth crisis really, I mean, being a straight edge band on top of animal rights and, yeah, and veganism and, and you know kind of like being militant about it and stuff like that was kind of like the first thing that I kind of heard uh, yeah in that vein other than just the straight up straight edge of not doing drugs and, and stuff like that. right um, yeah, yeah yeah same here man and and the thing was is you know I had the chance to see them a couple times and knew like like they meant every single word like they were that passionate. I'm not saying that they really meant they were going to go kill everybody, yeah. but that they really were that passionate and they, they meant they, they just were that frustrated with how things were going uh, both in the scene and, you know, in just in society. So meeting them and really knowing that they, you know, they, they walk the walk or whatever mm-hmm. definitely set, set the tone for me. Yeah. And so when break iron kind of, you know, dissipated and and you guys turned into abnegation how did that kind of transfer over how did that break iron end and how did abnegation begin because obviously there was like you know the topics that you guys were talking about in abnegation were were different than break iron yeah you know what i mean yeah yeah, yeah. uh so you know i think break iron we there was some drama like uh Zach and this other kid got into some some issues and uh, Paul was going to school. So I like he was going to go to school in Pittsburgh. And I think that sort of is what split up break iron. We just it just, you know, basically just went away. Yeah. Um, and then uh, but I kept in contact with Paul. You know, he, he was definitely one of one of my best friends. So we kept in contact and he met up with uh, a bunch of hardcore kids excuse me, at Pitt, and, uh, you know, he was bringing stuff home, like um, a lot of the new age stuff and everything, and he was so into it, so I was like, dude, well, let's just start a straight edge, baby. And it was hard at first trying to find other people that were, were down to be, you know, straight edge and vegan. Yeah. We, we sort of had to, mm, I don't know. It was veganism on a curve <laughs> with some of the guys. You know what I mean, man? Some of them just wanted to be in a band. They're like, yeah, sure, I'll be vegan. And then they'll be eating cheese. And they're like, whoa, I didn't know. <laughs> you know? But, um, but yeah, so, it, it, you know, that that was the transition. Was, was Paul was starting to, you know, hear a lot more other stuff and a lot more just straight up, straight edge stuff. Uh, and so we were like, yeah, you, you know, let's do it. Yeah, and and life for a life was the first demo, and that was the first thing you guys put out, right? And that was ninety three, ninety three, ninety three. That sounds right. Yeah, um, it, and it, it, like I remember the the uh, it was on a tape, right, a cassette, and it yes, had the cows on the on the front of it. I, I remember, <laughs> yeah, that back then. Doom, doom, doom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. I was kind of late though because I had to go back. Like once I I found Abnegation, um, I had to go back and get everything beforehand. So like my first impression of Abnegation was the chapter Abnegation Split, which oh which yeah like 
is so fucking brutal to me. And like that hit me so hard. Just like I remember, I, I don't know if it was the very distribution catalog that I was thumbing through and I saw the write up on it and I saw the cover and I was like, oh shit, this looks like pretty interesting. And then I got it and I got it home and I played it and I was like, holy shit, this is like <laughs> some brutal like stuff. And that was, yeah. that was up my alley back then, you know what I mean? So that so when, when you went back and listened to the other stuff where you're like, what the fuck? Well, <laughs> and, and, oh, I mean, you guys progressed, uh, you know, a lot sounding wise, you know what I mean? Because yeah. It was kind of like, you know, Extinguish the Sickness kind of reminded me of like, you know, kind of like, not that you guys sounded like Earth Crisis, but it was in that kind of vein, you know what I mean? It was kind of- We were ripping them off, man, it's okay. <laughs> You know, I mean, they were they were they were a huge influence on us for sure. Yeah, uh, it was hard for them. I, you know, I mean, that's what we listened to constantly. Um, and just being in into the vegan straight edge movement and everything like that, they were such a huge part of it. Mm. And again, you know, we were that that was like inspiration for us. So yeah, first, um, you know, they were they were definitely a big influence. I'm trying to think. Uh, raid we loved raid i still the first five raid songs on the compilation or the words of war or whatever um that i mean just the most brutal stuff ever yeah i'll still listen i still i mean i listen to earth crisis all the time still like it's all still holds up really well but uh but yeah i feel like you know those those were our big influences then and especially once we got chris uh you know paul and chris had been really really good friends for a long time yeah uh and both are like just fantastic musicians. So once we got Chris back in the band and they were able to write songs together, you know, that, that was, it just made us into a whole different band. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of how your sound progressed into, you know, yeah. how like, so, so what was the last thing that you had a part in recording was hopes of harmony, the last thing, or was, uh, or was it, Sold in the remains. I mean, what was the last thing that you recorded uh, with Abney? So, you know what, dude? I, to be 100% honest, I can't remember if it was the chapter split or Stones and Strike to Cedar demo. Mm. I can't remember which one came last. But um, it was one of those two things. Uh, like, uh, you know, and after that, so I think it was Stones. The Stones and Strike to Cedar demo was, was the last thing that uh, – I am Paul recorded on. Yeah, yeah. But where where did Hopes of Harmony in that so where did um, that go into like crime? Yeah, so that it went uh you know, Life for Life, Extinguish the Sickness, and then the Catalyst Seven Inch and then Hopes of Harmony. Yeah. And then uh you know, man, things back then especially just took so long to put out so like our sound like would constantly be progressing and by the time like say between extinguish extinguish the sickness and the catalyst seven inch like we were like almost a whole new band yeah and you know what i mean so it, it it definitely just uh it it was um it was sort of frustrating in that uh nonetheless though but yeah i think that that was the how things went the uh, Sandwich the Sickness, the Catalyst 7 Inch, and then Hopes. Yeah. And and was the thought process just that you guys wanted to sound? Because it's, it's like by the end of when you were in Abnegation, it like it just got eviler and, and more brutal and stuff like that. It, was that the thought process where you guys just wanted to get heavier and like more chaotic a little bit and stuff like that? Yeah. You know, I think a lot of that also had um, – what we were listening to had a huge impact on that. And uh, especially Chris and Paul, man, they, you know, all of a sudden, like in the van, it would be nothing or the Honda Civic, <laughs> depending on what we were able to, to drive in. Um, but would uh, be morbid angel, death, uh, cynic, like all the time, some male. And so they were definitely taking it into a lower tune and a lot more, um, heavier riffs and everything. Yeah. And then for me, I was listening to, uh, as vocally, I think what really had a huge impact on me was, um, Rorschach mm. and carcass, um, and groundwork like those bands. I mean, I, I just love that. I realized, Oh, you can still sound super heavy and scary 
and just scream. You don't, you know, I was trying to do all this guttural stuff. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it just, you know, it didn't even really make sense. You, I, you know, I would try to sound like I'm like some 300 pound, like muscle bound dude. And I'm not, <laughs> you know, so then I was like, oh, shit, you can still sound super crazy if you just like scream at your highest screech. I believe it was uh, Manny from uh, Race Trader. He, he called it a witch cackle. <laughs> I, I, I was like, all right, yeah, I see that, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I mean, like I said, it got to almost like an evil core sounding like thing. At the yeah. End. Um, which, like I always talk about Hopes of Harmony, and I've talked about it in other chats with, you know, me and Scott Mellinger was talking a couple weeks ago. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, 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 man. And our, Scott's a good dude. Our love for that song is just, like, unbelievable. And Stones That Mark the Fire was, like, a great compilation. But yeah. prop, props to you guys is, like, that was the song that I always went to. That was the first song that I went to. It's my favorite Thanks, man. on that compilation. I mean, and there were some, you know, heavy hitters on that. I mean, Earth Crisis was on that, Birthright. Yeah, and that Earth Crisis song is fucking badass, man. Culture, <laughs> Culture was on there. Tension. Yeah. There's some good bands on there, but I always, that was the first thing I listened to. It was my favorite song on that compilation. Um, the, the sample. Thanks. The sample with Natural Born Killers uh, with Woody Harrelson. Like, it's, yeah. I can't say you know good enough things about that song i love that song dude i i gotta come clean man about the sample i gotta apologize to uh jason from bound because we were uh one of his buddies this dude doug uh spangenberg who uh did like high roller studios like he recorded a bunch of the hellfest the earth crisis like uh documentary or video or whatever but he brought back this bound song that had that sample. And I was like, dude, we got to use that, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I feel bad now because it really is such a good sample. Yeah. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> but you, and it fit, man. It fit, you know. Where you guys put it, though, in the middle is like you know, some shit. Because you always hear it in the beginning or the end. But, like, right in the like right. In the middle, it just. It, yeah. yeah, right before the breakdown, man. That Yeah unbelievable it's like so so good and like i said i always talk do you what's that i always talk about it with whoever you know we, we bring up abnegation or because uh, paul that, that is paul was go ahead paul was on here too with nathan uh oh yeah yeah, yeah. we were dude you know what man how i kept on like when you popped up i'm like why how am i remembering this dude like, I couldn't remember if maybe you were doing something with, like, the Nickel City guys, like Chris Wyatt, those dudes. Or say, that was it. I watched I watched the uh, creation interview as much as a, of it as I could. And uh, so, there we go. Now I'm remembering, man. Yeah. But um, do you watch Curb, Your Enthusiasm at all? I do, yes. Did you see the newest episode with uh, Woody Harrelson in it? No, I haven't seen it. No, not yet. Uh, it's super good. And it really, he's, he's got this one part where I was like, oh, my God, it would be so awesome if, like, I was still vegan and we used that. Because <laughs> it was so good. I mean, it's, it's curved, so, you know, it's definitely a lot more sarcastic and funny, but it, it's pretty awesome. When you, when you get the chance to watch it, and it also happens to be one of the, my favorite episodes I've ever seen of it, too. Yeah. So <laughs> Now I definitely have to go and, and – uh, yeah, yeah, it's keep, good, man. Keep that out, definitely. Um, speaking of abnegation and touring, what was your kind of memories of like some of the good tours that you guys did? And I also wanted to ask about the Cleveland Fest in '96. I don't like. I didn't really know why uh, One King Down had a beef with you guys. So, what is the story with the the? Did they have a beef with you guys or One King? No, it was yeah, One Life Crew. That's what I meant. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> they did. I was like, one came down. I don't think they had a beef with us. <laughs> I feel <grew>, sorry. <laughs> um, so, you know, man, it's uh, – it, that was a, a mess. So as far as touring goes, and if I forget to come back – I won't forget because I, I, Cleveland Fest was the best show we ever played. Yeah, yeah. But as far as touring goes, all our, our tours were – I mean, you could call them tours because we would play a few shows in a span of a couple weeks and we would be on the road, but we would play like two or three shows, especially our first tour with uh, 
Ritual, which is um, Mike D.A. from Vegan Earth Order, and he was also an encounter. Ritual was his band at the time. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, dude, we spent way more time at, I believe it was called the Iron Skillet or something like that, truck stop in Toledo, yeah. than we did playing shows. <laughs> and that was awesome, man. Like, it was so good. Like, uh, some of my favorite memories, dude, was um, – well, for one, Chris, all he kept on singing, man, if, like we threw on Extinguish the Sickness and, you know, Birthright, he would always just go, the penis is alive! The penis is alive! So, like, the whole tour, we were doing that, man. Yeah. That, and then um, our bass player at the time, Donnie, we went to this one truck stop, and there was uh, an LB's Big Boy that was being remodeled. And Donnie, like, looked, peeked under, the, like, the curtain or whatever, and he saw millions of inflatable big boys. And all of a sudden, I just see him running out of there with a pillowcase full of them. And, like, you know, that was just – that was our mascot for the day, yeah. for, for, the, for the whole tour. But um, – and then the chapter tour, which was, you know, by then it was much better orga organized, and especially, like, Nathan uh, from chapter creation – you know, him and Paul were very serious. Um, and so they really took the helm and booked the shows and stuff. So that, that worked out a lot better. But that also, uh, we had a, a pretty bad accident. Um, it went like no one got hurt per se. But uh, what happened was um, Nathan wanted to try and make it from Chicago to Minneapolis. And he got, we were maybe like an hour outside of Minneapolis and he dozed and we went into um, the, it wasn't a meeting. It was like, you know, the grass in between the two, yeah, the two rows. Yeah. So the van just bounced all around. I know like uh, one of the girls that, that was with us, this girl, Mia, she still has like issues and stuff, you know, like, like, yeah, kind of. she got like whiplash and everything. But um, for the most part, no one, no one really got seriously hurt or anything like that. But that was also sort of, I think um, when, when Paul was like, you know what, I just, I need a break from, from the abnegation guys. And then uh, went on to do uh, creation because, and, you know, I, I, I get it, man. We, we were a, a unruly bunch and especially like um, Chris and Steele at the time, they were not really into the message. They just wanted to play heavy music. Yeah. They didn't really care about the politics or anything like that. So it was really starting to turn into a different band. Mm -hmm. So we were sort of losing sight of what Abnegation was about at that time. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that all that, that tour was really what sealed the deal. Yeah. Um, and for me, it actually was sort of... Uh, easy a little easier to walk away from because playing the cleveland fest and just how amazing that show was and then going on tour those shows were not <laughs> like cleveland but yeah. you know it really you know it humbled me because i was like oh my god we're about to like this is just gonna be huge and and i was like all right you know, we, we still need a lot more work. And yeah, yeah. that is one of the things that, you know, that made me be like, well, maybe it's just not time anymore, you know? Yeah. Um, but so Cleveland Fest. So, dude, I, I don't know for how long I, I was just, I had no idea why Dwid was, well, it wasn't just Dwid, it was Chubby Fresh, you know, the, the One Life crew dude. Mm. I had no idea why they were so mad at me. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then, you know, people were telling me about Blood Book. And then uh, when they played Eerie on that song Mediator, yeah, I we weren't there. We were on tour. But everyone in Erie was like, yo, dude, Twin said he wrote that song all about you, man. So I was like, what, what the hell? You know? And I, I thought for sure at Cleveland Fest, we were going to get it, man. I was like, we are going into the lion's den. And then their shit – happened the night before mm. where you know the they got into that big scuffle or whatever yeah and uh so i was like oh well that th they did that then they're coming for us tonight yeah nothing i was and so i never knew i was like well, what the hell man like i thought we were gonna be dead yeah yeah and then and, and i think that probably led to that show being so awesome too like you know just all that energy but um 
it was years later that one of my buddies that, you know, all the Erie dudes are, are pretty good friends with integrity and Dwight and stuff. Yeah. Uh, he's like, well, dude, he saw a video of you calling them sellouts. And I was like, <laughs> what? Well, I was like, yeah, man, I probably did because I was a stupid little kid. But th- it, I think the way that they understood what I was saying as far as them being sellouts was like they were like rock and roll stars now. Yeah, yeah. That they weren't like punk. Yeah. Not necessarily that they weren't straight edge anymore. And to me, I thought I, I said it matter of factly, like even yeah. though these guys, because we were covering an integrity song. Yeah. I was like, even though these dudes sold out, we're going we're gonna to play one of their songs. But, you know, they, they took it to heart. I don't know. But all that said, I chat with uh, DeWitt every now and then. So it's awesome, man. I, I you know, I, and he's definitely one of the vocalists that, I mean, I, I love his vocals. Yeah. Like I always love Dwid's vocals, man, no matter what. So it's cool, man. Yeah. I saw Chubby Fresh once and I totally stunned him, man. He, uh, he used to come to Erie for like this motorcycle show. Yeah. And I was with my son who was maybe like five or six at the time and we're walking around and then I see Chubby Fresh. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go say hi to him. And I tapped him on the shoulder and he turned around and just did not know what to say. He was like, so <laughs> like he was still wanting to fight me. And this is like maybe like 15 years later. Yeah, you know, he didn't do anything, but I was just like, dude, get over it, man. <laughs> Crazy. I had, I had to ask because I had heard. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had heard about it and always was wondering where it derived from, you know what I mean? Because it didn't make sense. Um, speaking on that kind of stuff, like when you guys played, you know, 21 plus shows, did, did was there any flack be, because of like the straight edge and the veganism and stuff like that? You get people like drinking and stuff like that. Was there any flack towards uh, abnegation ever? Not, not really, man. I mean, you know, there was definitely moments where we would have like, fights with drunk dudes yeah but not necessarily out of like our political stances or anything like that yeah um you know for the most part the the 21 over shows were mostly in erie anyways Mm -hmm. so it was mostly homies that were coming coming out to those so not not really so much that it it was uh (laughs) are you able to see the comments yeah i can (laughs) I, i don't think I, I don't believe I wore a, a wig, but I don't know, Rob. You, you might be right, man. <laughs> and some overalls. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I mean, where we got into the, the most was with how our stance about abortion. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that always led to debates at shows, which, I mean, is awesome. Like, that that is what hardcore punk rock is about, like, being called out and calling people out on, on bullshit, you know? So, yeah. um, and I miss those, those things. Not that, you know, my, my stance is nowhere near like it was then. Um, you know, I was thought of things of, um, thought of things in black and white. Yeah. Uh, you know, growing up and getting mature, you, you realize there's a lot of other components yeah. about stuff, but, um, but yeah, man, just, uh, those were the the most heated like moments where we're definitely at hardcore shows when when people were getting into it with us. Yeah, because the the song "Birthright" is the is like the pro life song, correct? Yeah, basically, you know. Yes. Yeah. It was. It was. Yeah. <laughs> it was. It's <was> pretty vicious. <laughs> we used to raffle, but like yes, we. Did. <laughs> but like, you go ahead. When you're young and, and you're, you know, you, like you said, seeing things black and white and, and you feel passionate about things like that, it, it's, you know, right. how they come across. And, and when you get older, I mean, I thought when I was young, I knew everything. And then when I got older, you know, I, I always thought like older people, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. I know this. And yeah. then when I got older, I was like, oh, well, maybe they, you know, they have some, they were, you know, they knew what they were talking about. And I kind of was just, you know, I had blind or I couldn't, you know, understand yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, you know, it, it was like, oh, they're just not dedicated. You know what I mean? But, think, you know, looking back now, it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> there's a lot, you know, there's a lot more things to start worrying about as you get older, like paying rent or your mortgage, putting food on the table. Yeah. That stuff really takes, you know, precedent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um Speaking of Earth Crisis and you guys, like, to me, 
you guys are synonymous with the the vegan and the animal rights stuff and, and the issues like that. Um, I can't really think of any bands besides you two that were really that dominant on on that subject. Maybe like Birthright kind of delved into that a little bit, and then yeah, you guys might have influenced a lot of bands going forward because I know you guys started '93 and you kind of ended in in '96 ish. Well, with you in it at, at least, but yeah, then you saw like culture started you know and morning again and and day of suffering kind of in seven came out with the eternal jihad and undying demo in 98 i think they had you know you guys must have had an influence on those bands because they were kind of going in your steps of like that type of style i feel uh i you know i mean there there was like a first wave of vegan straight edge bands uh that we were a part of for sure. Green Rage, unfortunately, they didn't. You know, they just did the seven inch. But man, that that seven inch is so brutal, man. Talk about like high pitched screaming vocals, like Justin. Like, I mean, he sounded like the devil reincarnate. <laughs> um, and I do feel like, you know, we we were setting the tone of, and especially even more so than Earth Crisis as far as going more death metal mm. and, you know, in that direction than just, like, um, like a metallic hardcore sound. Yeah. Uh, so I think that did sort of start, we, you know, started to get that ball rolling. Um, and it, Dave's suffering, too. Like, they're, they're, you know, I went back and listened to Eternal Jihad. And I was like, holy moly, it, it is like a straight up death metal album. Yeah, it, it, you know, it's definitely yeah. heavy. <laughs> but I love that. I love that album. Um, speaking, yes. Of, speaking of death metal and heaviness, uh, when you left the band, Versus of Bleeding came out. And like, to me, I'm not knocking that at all, but I was so accustomed to you doing the vocals and in abnegation sounding how it was sounding with the chapter split and and, and you know sewn in the remains and, and stuff like that and then that came up and i was kind of like set back a little bit for me personally i'm not knocking it by any any you know yeah well it was a different band for sure man you know i think um uh and i've said before man I get it why they kept abnegation as, as the name they both put in ton of work and money um, into abnegation and getting to it to where it was. And I, I could see why they wanted to keep it. I do feel like if they would have changed the name of the band, then that might've been uh, that album might've been well more received mm. because it really is a, a good death metal album, but it's just not what people were expecting, you know? And I, I think that's why, what you know sort of threw people off if you will or whatever um and i i just feel like they probably could have gone a lot further mm. if if they you know would have changed the name of the band or whatever but you know again i get it and it is it's a great album man it, it is heavy it's brutal still changed some of my words but whatever <laughs> um yeah and that you know that was a hard thing sort of uh leaving navigation, but I also knew like Dave and Chris, that's what they wanted to do was a death metal band. They did not, they were not feeling hardcore anymore. That was not their jam. They did not like all the politics involved with it, you know, and they, so that, that is what they wanted to do. So I stuck it out a little bit longer than, than Paul did. Yeah. Um, and Nate, uh, but that it just, reach a moment where I was just like, uh, you know, it just wasn't, it wasn't abnegation anymore. I'd never been in a band without Paul. Yeah. So once he left, I was sort of like, I don't even know how I'm going to be able to do this. And then it just, it just fizzled for me that, that passion for it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, like I said, my first impression was I, like, I was surprised, honestly. I was, I was like, yeah. An abnegation. I was like, I, and like you said, it's a good, it's a good record. It's a good death metal record, definitely. But it's not, yeah. for me, it's not abnegation. I am, right. I'm not knocking anything like that. I'm just saying. Oh, no, no, no. For sure, sure, man. I think they understand that too. Yeah. And just the album cover and all kinds of stuff. I was just taken back by it. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Dude, did you see like uh, about the cover? How in the, uh, um, with the whole QAnon stuff? that they were saying that that cover of the album was from when Hillary Clinton tore off 
the little girl's face and wore it all around. And that was like the result. So like last year, man, all of a sudden, like the abnegation stuff on like YouTube yeah. started to get like so many plays because people were going back and forth about it. We were like, it's a pimple attack. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it was so funny, though, how all of a sudden, and I don't even know, like, who was like, oh, abnegation, they have that picture. You know what I mean? I, I don't even know how how that even started, but that was pretty crazy. Wow. That, <laughs> oh, I, I didn't hear that. That's what, that's insane, though. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you look up on YouTube, man, look up abnegation versus the bleeding, the comment threads on there are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely going to have to check that out. Um, yeah, yeah. So after Abnegation, what uh, were you kind of like all set with playing in bands at that moment and kind of trying to do something else? I mean, what what did you do after Abnegation? Well, so for a brief moment, I was still trying to find people to to you know do a band with and stuff. Um, but I also uh, went through um, a, a pretty tough breakup. Um, and really sunk pretty hard into depression. And I just started, you know, I, I was just, I was, I was eating a lot of ecstasy. I was doing a lot of drugs. Yeah. Um, started drinking and stuff. And that just, uh, you know, obviously my passion wasn't there. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and hardcore, unfortunately, you know, it wasn't helping. Like, um, you know, if you read like the abnegation lyrics, especially towards the end, man, like I, I was sinking pretty low, thinking about suicide a lot. Uh, and hardcore being so dark and heavy, the stuff that I was listening to, you know, it, it just brought those feelings right up front. And uh, so I, I had to take a, a step away and, you know, eating ecstasy, I was going to lots of raves, <laughs> yeah. stuff like that. You know what I mean? But really, you know, I mean, not to sound like a jackass, but, uh, I, I feel as though that, that probably saved me, man. I, you know, I did not, um, luckily drugs like, uh, Coke and what have you like heavier drugs like that didn't really have that same pull for me. Ecstasy was, was the thing because, you know, part of ecstasy is like, you're elated. Yeah. Like your, your thoughts are the best thoughts times a thousand. Yeah. And, um, rave culture for as, you know, based on drugs as it is, it is also very family oriented. Mm. So like I met up with my people there, you know, I, and I feel like that, uh, you know, helped me get through probably one of the hardest mental times that I, I had ever faced up until that point, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. So like doing a band, it just, it wasn't even on my, my radar. And, and now you, set up a skate shop too so where was that in the yeah. timeline of things was that kind of after your you know oh yeah. yeah 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 that that was actually not that long ago that was about uh 10 years ago, Ten years ago. um you know uh, honestly half the reason though that we started that skate shop was uh, me and my buddy steve we were starting to skate a bunch again and we knew erie was going to be getting a skate park so uh we were like well yeah you know let's do a you know, let, let's try and work out maybe putting together a skate shop. And at that same time, I was starting to, uh, my wife and I were, were having some, some issues. We separated and I knew that, you know, given my past history, that if I did not have something positive to focus on, chances are I was going to be making some, some really big mistakes. Yeah. And, you know, having a wife and wanting to work that out and having two kids you know, I, I did not want to even tempt that. So yeah. that, that was like really the genesis for uh, that. So our shop was 2189. Um, and, uh, you know, to this day, man, I, I definitely feel like that, that helped me uh, at least like emotionally save my life financially. That was a pretty big hit. But uh, other than that, you know, Erie's, it's just not quite the town to try and open up a business, at least at that time yeah. like that, especially we didn't have snowboards and Erie has some of the roughest winters ever. So, you know, we didn't really think it out. It was more or less like a clubhouse for us and our buddies. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah. And at that time, you know, I, uh, I had booked hip hop shows here and there. Um, and then once I started to do the skate shop, I started to do uh, a monthly called boom bap, 
uh, and I started to get way, way more into booking hip hop shows in Erie too. Nice, nice. So that was another thing going on. Nice. Um, so, so what kind of got you to move? You, you're from Portland now, right? Portland, Oregon. Uh, Eugene. And, and Eugene. Yeah. What brought you from Erie to Eugene? So, my wife and I and our daughter, when she was one back in 2003. Uh, we had met a couple that lived in Eugene and were living in Erie and they got us super hyped up about it. You know, they're like, Oh yeah, go check it out. Yeah. So we went and checked it out and we really loved it. Um, so we decided to move there, but the work situation and we didn't have any help with our daughter, you know, we didn't have any family or anything like that. Yeah. So it just, it just didn't pan out the way we thought it would. So, uh, we moved back first, we moved back to Pittsburgh mm -hmm. and that, that, which is where my wife is from. And then uh, decided to move back to Erie. So we both went through nursing school in that time. Yeah. And uh, I was doing home care, but my wife got way into um, birth, like childbirth. So for a long time, she was a doula. And then she became a midwife assistant. And she decided to get um, her RN. And she was not into doing like labor and delivery in a hospital. She wanted something a little bit more... Um, you know, where there weren't so many interventions and stuff. Yeah. So we knew that Eugene, you know, had a, a very progressive uh, community as far as birth and stuff go. Yeah. So we're like, well, shit, you know, let's let's move out there. We know we liked it. Um, and this time we brought my mother-in-law in -law along with us too. Yeah. So that really helped us uh, plant our roots here now. Yeah. Nice, nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I, I also wanted to ask about the band funerals. Um, I don't, I don't know too much information. I know you had, had your hand in that band. Um, can you tell me like more information? Yeah. That? So, um, you know, once we got here, I started to go to shows, uh, trying to find, you know, what was going on. And, uh, I, I'd, I'd seen funerals and I chatted with those guys. And I mean, to me, you know, I, I love nineties hardcore still, you know what I mean? I love integrity. I love bloodlet. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, these guys are doing some dark evil hardcore too. So they just asked me to, uh, if I wanted to do some backing vocals mm -hmm. on a couple of their tracks. So that, that, that's all like my involvement was yeah. me and, uh, their guitar player, Sean, we, especially once, uh, you know, COVID happened, it, uh, we had a lot more time on our hands. We were starting to try and play around with maybe starting a band. He wrote a bunch of awesome stuff. Yeah. But I just, you know, I just didn't have that same anger at the time. And it, it was hard for me to really come up with words. I, I never thought I would have that issue. Yeah. Usually people can't shut me up. But, um, you know, it just, it just didn't pan out. But I still talk to Sean a bunch. Super good dude. I'm excited. Whatever he's going to do next, I'm sure we're, we'll be super good. Yeah. So is that like, speaking on this, is there still a fever inside you to do heavy music or kind of like, you know, you, like you were saying, you just kind of don't have it in you. Um, because for me, similar, uh, you know, I was in some, you know, hardcore emo uh -oh. type of band. Oh, oh, there you are. I didn't hear the question. Yeah. Um, I was saying like, I kind of was in the same situation where um, I was in some screamy hardcore bands for 10 years. And I feel like my first like recordings and like, you know, creative process was a lot better than like when it, it kept going. And I kind of, like you said, I couldn't think of lyrics. I wasn't as sharp as I was. Um, is there still a fever for you to play heavy music right now? Or is that kind of a thing where you're just like, all right, I've done that. And like, you know what, man, actually, I feel like, and I feel like this was probably the only way I would probably be about it, but um, we're talking about maybe doing some shows again, at Negation. Uh, and um, yeah, hopefully, you know, middle of next year is, is we're trying to be realistic about it. And yeah. that, that seems to be when it, when it might happen. We we're talking to a couple of dudes that, that want to help out, but it'd be, you know, me, Paul, Chris, Steele, and then uh, our original, um, bass player this dude steve maynard uh yep. if he gets his shit together and really practices and stuff i hope he hears that <laughs> that's also the steve that i opened up the skateboard shop with he's definitely like my partner in crime if we were like yeah. the three students <laughs> but um 
yeah, and so I feel like that um, that setup, like just doing like abnegation stuff, even though, yeah, yeah obviously our, our politics um, are much different now, and we we know we couldn't be the same band, so things will have to change if we decide to write new songs. Yeah, but um, you know, there's a whole era or two at our age of kids that would love to see on yeah. and we would love to play. So it's like, well, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens, but, um, but that, that's probably going to be a thing. Hopefully. Oh, that's awesome. That, that's awesome. Congratulations too. Like, uh, Thanks, man. hopefully you uh, make it up the East coast around Boston area. Cause I, uh, you know, I uh, do. I, I would love that, man. Well, we'll see what happens. I just feel like now we're, uh, you know, we didn't do abnegation right. Like, we we didn't think of it as um, and it's not it's not meant to be a business, but we did not think of those aspects. Like we probably had one run of shirts, and that was for Cleveland Fest. Yeah, like no labels ever did merch for us, anything like that. Yeah, uh, and our shows, you know, we we just weren't very strategic, if you will. So I feel like being a little bit and and knowing that we would have to, it would be a commitment, like. Being on the West Coast, uh, Steel's on the West Coast too. You know, we would be having to fly, pay for flights, stuff like that. Yeah. So it's like I, I feel like we'd we'd be a little bit more strategic, and it, it would. I don't know. Hopefully, something like an East Coast tour would happen. <laughs> yeah. No, that would be amazing. Speaking of shirts, I saw a. Uh, it was like an abnegation shirt that was maroon that said, uh, "Cover me in a blanket of black," and uh, it had that wild picture on the back. And then, yeah, I'm like, oh. I'm like, "Where did that shirt come from?" Because I saw that on Instagram, and I'm like, "Holy shit!" Like, I've never even seen that. Like, where can I? Get yeah. That? So uh, we did that. Uh, well, I did that. You know, I it wasn't. I probably should have talked to the band about it, but I didn't. But that was a, uh, I believe that was a fundraiser for um, Shelter Farm Sanctuary. Yeah. Uh, um, Mike Presley. Like, I, I believe that we did a benefit shirt for, for him, uh, you know, for that. And then we also did a, a benefit for, um, during all the, the civil unrest, the Black Lives Matter march. Yeah. We did a, uh, like a um, bail, bail defense type thing, you know, fundraiser for for that. And uh, we, my buddy, this dude, uh, John Quest, who is a phenomenal MC out of Pittsburgh, and he's also a photographer. We use some of his pictures for those shirts. So there's a couple um, miscellaneous abnegation things that have popped up. You know, uh, shout out to uh, Hav from uh, um, Contraband Goods. He uh, put out, um, I don't know if you heard, there is a new remix, remastered version of Stones to Strike the Cedar, the, the tape. Oh, no. And Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so um, Paul's brother, Steve, who uh, is um, a phenomenal recording engineer, he remixed it for us. Oh. Uh, and it, it almost sounds like a, a whole different album wow. or whatever, demo or whatever. Yeah. But, um, and Javier, he he put that out for us. And there there's some shirts that went along with that too. I'll hit you like he he put up a that dude has been so good to us. Like he put up a band camp for us and everything. Yeah. Uh, but I'll hit you with that. You can you can check it out. It's pretty good. Yeah, I, I think it is. Yeah, like I said, I saw the shirt and I was like, holy shit, where can I get this shirt? I was like, I was I never saw it before. And then all of a sudden I saw it and I was like, damn, like where this? Shirt? Yeah, because yeah, you know, man, and like I love that shirt. I love that picture of Paul. And we also uh, did one with uh, Donnie, our old bass player, who who has uh, passed away since then. But man, like, just I don't know. I love them. I'll I'll, I'll wear my own band T shirt because they're badass. <laughs> but uh, that picture of Paul is actually from when uh, he played in Green Rage for one of their shows. Yeah, and that was actually from the Green Rage set. <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> I always love that. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's funny. That's that's. <laughs> Um, usually, um, at the end of like my talks, I usually do a rapid fire. And, uh, so I'm probably, will probably shoot you a uh, rapid fire right now. All right, man. All right. My first question, all time favorite New England hardcore punk band for you all time in New England. Like, oh, I for an eye, I'll, I'll say I for an eye. 
I've never, you know, or slap shot. You know, but eye for an eye, really. I think that's the one that I like the best for sure. Which is which is great because that's the first eye for an eye I've had so far in in the ah. in almost seventy talks. That's it. And uh, I love <laughs> eye for an eye. I I remember seeing yeah. them you know, uh, yeah. times back in the day. So uh, I love eye for an eye. Very young, yeah. Underrated, and they don't get talked about. Oh, for sure, man. Um, Definitely push the boundaries. Oh, definitely. Right? You know, I mean, sonically, like, their music, nothing else was coming out like that at that time, for sure. It was, it was uh, yeah, I think the last time I saw him, I saw him with the Iceman and Killing Time, actually, and, oh. and Wrecking Crew. It, it was like a... <laughs> oh, dude, if I didn't even think of Wrecking Crew, but they would definitely be up there, too. Yeah. Wrecking Crew is pretty bad. That That is definitely one of the more thrashier bands I liked back in the day. Yeah, Balance of t- Terror is so good. Yeah. So good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, my second question. What was the first punk hardcore show you attended? Like, the real hardcore show. What was the first one that you attended? So the first punk uh, show that I attended, it, it was the first show at this place called Continental Ballroom, which is, like, as far as Erie goes, one of the more historic venues. Uh and it was a local show with My Three Scum, Lost, and this band Backwash. Uh, and, you know, that – so up until that point, man, I, I went to, like, um, a Catholic school and everything. I, I didn't even know there were other punk rock kids in the area. And that show, there was probably, like, 250 people there, 200, 250. And, I, I mean, I was just floored. And I was sold too. Right then, I was like, "All right, this is this is it," you know. Yeah. And then, um, you know, all the shows for a while were were mostly every once in a while a hardcore band would be put onto a, a punk bill, mm-hmm. but there was never really like a just like a straight up all hardcore bands. Yeah. Until uh, Mike Ski started to book shows. Mike Ski and this dude Ben Frazier uh, started booking shows, and we started to get like. Um, Solid State, who used to be, you know, they turned into Snapcase, yeah. uh, Outface, Integrity. Like, we started to get those shows. And then, so that is, you know, not to say there's not too much of a difference between punk rock and hardcore, if you will, yeah. you know, and when you get down to it, you know, but um, that, yeah, you know, so that, there's that. But yeah, it was all local. My Three Scum, those dudes, especially Larry, I see him every once in a while when I'm back in town. Super good dude. Yeah. Like, you know, I look back now, I, we had it so good. We we lucked out. Growing up when I grew up in Erie, for sure. Yeah, yeah, def- definitely. Um, now, now, speaking of hardcore shows, were you uh, were you a mosher before you got into bands? Were you uh, in the pit? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And oftentimes, man, I was the bait. Because, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a pretty little dude. So, like, I would go mosh super hard and I would mosh someone. And then they'd get pissed. And then all the other dudes, like Rob Whipple, he, they were just they're, – they're ready. They were waiting. They were hoping that that was going to happen and, you know, things would get set off. But I, I had my moment in the pit for a while. Up until, like, man, once uh, we started going to Syracuse shows yeah. and they were doing crazy stuff, I was like, I will get killed. Yeah. <laughs> I will just stand back here. I, I am definitely now, especially – when I go to shows, I, I'm in the way back. <laughs> you know, I'm, I try to get on the side just to, to record. Yeah. I've been recording, like, you know, since 88. I've been recording. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Stuff like that. Oh, that's awesome, man. And, uh, like, for a while there, I wasn't going to any heavy shows. Um, and I was just solely recording hip-hop shows in Boston. Oh, really? In Boston, yeah. So. Oh, that's cool, man. Um, and, and luckily, my the buddy – he was like the uh he was like the club manager and he was also doing promotion for his own company so like you know krs1 would come to town and he would let me go onto the side of the stage where i was like 10 feet away from him and nobody was in front of me and i could just like record like nice. do you have those up on like youtube and stuff i have a, a bunch on my video thing on my instagram and there's uh i have my youtube page too which i'll, I'll link to you uh, there's like maybe i didn't put everything i have on there because i yeah i started putting putting them on but there's probably you know 10 or 12 like things uh up there nice but i have like 50 different sets from you, know, you name it but it's all like our style of hip hop, you know. Yes. Yeah. 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 Awesome, dude. I will. I will definitely check that out. Then. I know you're a West Side Gun and Conway and Benny fan, and uh, I have a video of them when they. It was almost like 
possibly their first live show they ever did in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Really? And you can tell that it's like one of their first. They were, you know, it was a little green hornish. You know what I mean? But uh, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's fun to watch, definitely. That, that's cool, man. Yeah, I just saw Conway, dude. Probably one of the best hip hop shows I've seen, at least in a long time. I, I don't. Have you ever checked out Odyssey? From uh, he's from so. Yep. There, that's probably the best hip hop show I've seen when he plays with his band, Good Company. Yeah. Um, but Conway, and then he brought out West Side Gun, and uh, which you know I didn't know West Side was going to be there, and um, Stove God Cook. Oh yeah. Uh, he opened up, so I mean that it was just an awesome show. Oh, that's sick. But yeah, I'll, I'll definitely have to look up your shows, man. That's awesome. Yeah, definitely. I'll send you a link to like a bunch of things. I'll tag you and stuff like. Cool. That. Um, all right, I'll keep going. Sorry. I, I, yeah. Oh, that's all right, man. On. It's not very rapid fire, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my next question. What was your all-time favorite show that you played in Abnegation? Uh, Cleveland Fest. Easy, man. That, you know, um, for many reasons, but, I mean, just that it was in a gymnasium that was packed. Yeah. And people, uh, you know, went nuts. It, it, it was awesome. That, that was easily the best show we ever played. And uh, it was also one of the last times I, I had a really good friend from Milwaukee, this dude, Paul Gazo, who um, he passed away. He had a, he had an accident where a roof, he was painting some rooftop and the roof caved in and, and he fell. Yes. Uh, and that was like one of the last times I saw him, you know, is that show just in general was, was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. The video on, on YouTube is amazing. Like it's, a, you see the energy and like the, yeah. Like it's definitely. I, I hate to big up myself or anything like that, or or abnegation, you know. But I watch that a lot because it's just I love it, man. And if anyone is ever like, "Oh, you're in a band," what what should I look up? I'm like, you gotta look up this show. <laughs> you know for sure, definitely. Um, all right, my next question: What was your all time favorite hardcore punk show you attended that you that you didn't play? Like a hardcore show that you attended that you were blown away by. I would have to say the first time I saw Zero Tolerance. Like, uh, that was at this place called the Sky Room. Uh, and it was a, a mixed bill. So I want to say it was uh, Zero Tolerance, Solid State, and Slapshot with, like, Cannibal Corpse, because they were from Buffalo at the uh time. And uh, maybe Violence or something like that played. But, uh, you know, up until that point, I, I hadn't gone to too many out-of-town shows yeah. yet. And uh, all I kept on hearing about was Zero Tolerance. Like, yeah. uh, Rob Whipple and Mike Ski, like, those dudes were in. And our good friend, this dude, Dan Perry, that uh, he passed away. But um, that's all they would talk about. Like, easily the best Buffalo band ever. You know, so many rumors. So I didn't, you know, I knew it was probably going to be pretty great, but I didn't know what to expect. And uh, I still, I mean, I remember it so clear, man. Standing right up front, they shut all the lights off. And then they started to play um, Tubular Bells, the theme song from uh, Halloween. Oh. Halloween or Friday the 3rd. <laughs> that started to come over the speakers. And then they just barged out. And it was just like an onslaught. And that, you know, just... I mean, their presence was just phenomenal. And that was right when uh, dudes started to use, like, wireless, like, for, you know, like, connecting to their amps and stuff. So they could just go nuts, like, all over the stage. Yeah. That was easy. Easily my, my favorite show I've ever been to. That's a, that's a crazy No matter what genre. That's a What's that? Too. That's a crazy lineup. Uh, speaking yeah, of, oh, yeah. Speaking of Slapshot, Slapshot just played this. this I saw that, man. Past. Yeah, and Stars and Stripes. Yeah, it was like 35 years of Slapshot and Sheer Terror played, too. Yes, yeah, yeah. I saw a bunch of Dude, I'll tell you what, man. I saw uh, maybe two years ago, I saw Sheer Terror, Negative Approach, and I Hate God um, in Portland. Yeah. And phenomenal. They all sounded so good. I was like... I can't even go to a show and talk loud for a while and not lose my voice. And these guys sound like spot on. Yeah. Uh, uh, they're, yeah. So good. Yeah. I saw Shia Tara about two years ago too. And, and the tour that you're talking about that, that came through too, but I think I had saw Shia Tara like two months before and because at the club, the middle East Cambridge, Massachusetts, they have an upstairs and a downstairs and downstairs. I was, I was watching, um, Slane, 
and Chris Rivers, uh, big pun. Son. Oh, and yeah, 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 yeah. And then Sheer Terror was playing upstairs, and I talked to what? him, and I was, <laughs> I was like, "Hey, can I go upstairs?" And he's like, "Yeah." And he took me through the kitchen and went up, and I and I watched nice. the whole Sheer Terror set, and then I went back down and I watched. Ah. Plane and Paul Bearer was like standing right beside me the whole time, like while we were on the stage. Not really, man. That is so good, dude. Yeah, it was that's a great night. <laughs> great night. I was I was pumped that I got to see Cher Terra. You know what I mean? I was like, oh for sure, man. From back like you know in the late eighties and stuff like that. So I was pumped to just get to see him again because you know, yeah, such a great and dude. Paul is the best front man. Oh. He just busts balls constantly yeah it's great yeah it's awesome um all right i'll keep going sorry um i all I, i'm a big movie guy so i always ask this what was the last movie you watched oh uh well we just watched a documentary um called uh gather which is all about um like uh American Indians and basically how one of the things that was attacked was their food sources mm -hmm. and how it's still going on to this day and uh, what, what an impact it has on, on their culture, um, you know, in erasing their culture. So there's this movement movement within um, American Indian tribes to um, sort of take it back and start to really hone in on on American Indian uh, cooking yeah. using like native ingredients and stuff like that. So it was that was super good. That was the last movie last movie I watched. Nice, nice. Yeah, I always ask because I'm always I'm always watching movies, and, and I try to not watch things over again. So I'm always looking for new movies to watch. That's that's my thing. I was trying. To, oh yeah, I was trying to watch 365 movies in one year, and I couldn't do it. <laughs> And I, oh, yeah. I cut it down to like 200 new movies and it took me three years to finally get to 200 in one year. <laughs> uh, it was dude. I, uh, so doing home care, I used to work for this dude who had a uh, cerebral palsy and he was, um, a graduate of the local, um, university for film studies. And my job was every Friday when a new movie would come out, I would have to, so this was in Edinburgh about 30 minutes away from Erie. I'd have to drive him to Erie and we would spend the day, get lunch, and then we would go see a movie or two. Yeah. So then he wanted to go to uh, film this film course that was during the summer at USC. So he had me move out there with him and we watched five or six movies a day. Yeah. Like just crush it. And it was fun because he, um, you know, his mentals were totally on point. He just, he couldn't talk. Yeah. So we didn't even really talk too much, you know, he, like he'd give like one word answer. So, I mean, almost all of our communication was watching movies. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I love movies too, man. My favorite movie ever is Bottle Rocket, the first Wes Anderson oh, movie. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that, yeah. That's so good. That's so good. Yeah. Um, I, I want to see what's the what's the new one that he has the French Dispatch. I haven't seen it yet. I, I'm dying to. Oh, I, I, you know, dude, it's a Wes Anderson movie. Yeah, not like huge surprises, but I, I love it. Yeah. I, I thought it was great. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's definitely on one of my lists coming up to to watch that movie. Um, also uh, with the movie questions, I always ask all time favorite horror movie for you. Uh man, you know what? Um, I need to rewatch it because I haven't seen it in so long. But when I was a kid, you know, I love all the the chains, you know, like uh, Friday the 13th and Halloween. And I really got into the Omen and the Exorcist like those. But the movie that has really stuck with me is um, Something Wicked This Way Comes, which, uh, you know, I was probably – like 10 or 11 when I saw it. Yeah. And I mean, it was, it is awesome. It is dark. And I, have you ever seen it? I have seen it. Yeah. Yeah. I, oh yeah, man. I, it's time ago. I, yeah. I need to go and rewatch it because it's been a long time since I've seen it. Yeah. That, that, that's probably horror movie wise that. And I think one of my favorites is uh 30 days a night. 30 days a night is a good one. I, that's probably <laughs> vampire movie that's out because like it, there's a lot of bad vampire movies and that's oh yeah that's probably that, that is so good god <laughs> there's no god <laughs> <laughs> that's so good in that too yes yeah he's really good in that um my next question i'm i'm a huge hip-hop guy just like you um 
what have you been listening to for hip hop lately? Uh, you know, in the past couple, in the past month. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's four, four dudes that I can say pretty much is all I've been listening to. Um, this dude, Luca, who is from Memphis or yeah, Memphis. He's from, from Tennessee. Does not sound like he's from the South at all. Yeah. Definitely one of my favorite MCs right now. There's this dude that opened up for Conway that's on drum work. Um, Lucky seven mm -hmm. who uh, also super phenomenal. Um, and then there's these Toronto dudes, uh, Brown bag money. Oh yeah. All stars, uh, Daniel son, a son Eastwood. Those guys. I, I love them, man. Yeah. I love them. Yeah, Daniel. That, that has definitely been getting the most plays for me, as well as going back to like old mixtapes and stuff like that. But those new stuff, that that's it right there. Yeah, yeah. Daniel Sun is is, is like him and Future Wave together, like doing the. Oh, I know, dude. Right. It's yeah. It's good, and it kind of reminds me of like uh, there's a guy from up here from Lynn, Massachusetts, called St. Knack. I don't know if you've heard him. Oh yeah, he's on. Uh, you know what, man? He's on the new Luca album. Oh really? No kidding. Oh, I'll yeah. Check that out. Yeah, St. Knack is, is really, and he was. Uh, yeah. Um, he was on. Uh, was it Fly God Two that he was on too with West Side Gun? I think he's on one track. I think so. Yeah, he's on one. Track. I think so. I can't remember which one it is though. But uh, yeah. he's a dude that has grown on me. At first, just you know, just like uh, Stove God Cook. Mm. Like at first, I didn't really get into him, but then I saw him. And then I listened to the album a few times, and now, like, I listen to it all the time. Yeah, 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 that's awesome. Yeah, I'm always listening to hip-hop. I Like, I just posted the other day that I was listening to the Stolly uh, Apollo Brown. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Is that pretty good? The Apollo Brown beats, like, you can't go wrong with Apollo yeah. Brown beats. So, like, I'm not a huge Stolly fan, but, like... Uh, Same, man. It, it, but when I thought that they were doing an album together, I was like, well, I'll give them a chance yeah. because of that. Because Apollo Brown, I mean... It doesn't get too much better as far as modern day producers. Yeah, it, than, it than goes him. pretty good with the beats. I, I mean, I kind of like the Sky Zoo Apollo Brown a little bit better. Yeah, um, that was yeah, phenomenal. But this is this is pretty smooth, and uh, I was surprised on how how you know I well I liked it. You know what I mean? Cool, cool. I'll definitely have to to check that out, man. Um, and so my my final question is what was your favorite song to play live in abnegation or, or a couple of songs that you, you know, love to play? Uh, hopes definitely helps a harmony. Um, and, uh, uh, shiver from the catalyst seven inch, yeah. those two songs, you know, probably meant the most to me. Like shiver definitely meant a lot to me. And then hopes just, it just has to me, it has such good breakdowns and stuff that you could just really go nuts. And people, like, you know, if you ask anyone that's in the abnegation, that's almost everyone's favorite song. Yeah. So, like, you know, everyone's singing along. It's uh, it definitely, definitely hopes, man, for sure. Yeah, hopes. I think, I think if we would have uh, played the chapter split and Stones, you know, a little bit more often before we broke up. Yeah. Excuse me. You know, like, if we were a band a little bit longer than that stuff, Probably would be up there too. Yeah. That's my favorite stuff to listen to. Yeah, like behind the white walls is is by far one of my favorite songs too. And and um, uh, yeah, I, I love that song. Like a uh, siphon, I really like from uh, Extinguished. Oh, Extinguished Sickness, yeah. And uh, Jihad is is like another one of my favorite songs too. Um, so if when Abnegation comes back together again, will there be? Uh, are you guys planning on doing like? old songs and then maybe a few new songs or is it, it at first just going to be just like the old songs pretty much right now you know we'll see how it goes we would like to do new songs mm. and if we do do new songs i mean sonically it'll probably be in that that same vein but obviously lyrically you know it'll be a different band we won't do it as abnegation um if we start to write new songs yeah but uh the you know, our plan right now is is definitely almost not all the old songs, but definitely a good mix of all the, you know, all of our favorites, at least. Yeah. And and if you play live, would it be, uh, you know, Eerie would be the first jump off for playing live? Is that your goal? It could It'd be, you know, we'll see what happens, man. I, I'm, I have a good friend in Pittsburgh that sets up shows that, you know, I, I think... I don't know. We'll see, man. Erie will 
if we do a show in Erie, it will probably be the you know like just a, a little bit of a sneak attack. Yeah. Who knows when we'll do it or whatever, but just and you know just to see how we are live before we do anything else. So yeah. that would probably happen for sure. Thick. Yeah. Thick. I'm pumped up. I think you know I, I feel like. Almost like um, trying to name your band before you have a show curses the band. Yeah. You know what I mean? Before you even, like, have a practice. So I hate to, like, call it. Who knows what's going to happen? But I, I, hopefully those things will happen. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I'll be pumped. Uh, and uh, congratulations. If, if the, everything comes together, I, I can't wait. And uh, like I said, I Thanks, man. to the Boston area. So, you know, I can witness the uh, awesomeness that, you know, abnegation. I, I appreciate that, man. Um, I want to thank you again so much for taking time. Thank you, dude. Today. This is great. And, and chat. This is great. Uh, and uh, if, if there's anything you want to plug or anything like that you got going on, uh, now's the time. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I just want to say, you know, obviously, you know, I'm super psyched that we might be playing shows again. And I, I'm, I'm really, I feel blessed that we've been able, you know, we had differences and stuff like that and we're, we're putting those behind us. So I'm psyched on that. Um, and that my wife is as supportive as she is and she wants to see me do things that, you know, I, I really want to do because that will be a sacrifice me having to go across country again to, you know, to play a couple punk rock shows, <laughs> you know, so I, I'm very blessed in that. And, um, I also, you know, I, I really don't know if I would be as motivated as I am if it wasn't for like the race trader guys, mm -hmm. those guys, um, you know, uh, Andy lives in Portland. So when race trader was recording their new stuff, um, they invited me up and, uh, to do some backing vocals. And not only that, they, they were cool with my daughter coming. She got to do some backup vocals oh. and that, I mean, that just meant the world to me. So I, I really, anything I do, I always want to make sure I, I just say how much I love those guys. Those they, they've really welcomed me like family, man. Yeah. I've always loved race trader. So it's such a great, great, great band. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Brutal. So, Super brutal, man. So brutal. Definitely. Um, thank you again so much. And, yep. you know, stay safe out there. You know, uh, anything you, right back at you, dude. you ever need, just get in touch with me. I'll send you those links for the hip hop show cool. like that. And uh, let's stay in touch. Definitely. For sure, Hal. Thanks, man. All right, man. Iggy, have a great night. Yeah, you too, brother. All right. Peace.